Hello, I'm Bill Reid. I'm a volunteer at the Athelstan Museum in Malmesbury, North Wiltshire, and we were very proud in 2020 to receive an award from the British Association for Local History for our Malmesbury Voices collection of spoken memories. And the story I'm going to give you some glimpses into today concerns the Linolite light fittings factory. It existed in Malmesbury for just over 50 years, founded by the inventor of the strip light, Alfred Butel, and run by three generations of his family before being taken over by others and then eventually closed in 1993. When Linolite came to Malmesbury in 1941, it occupied this old mill known as the Postern Mill. But it wasn't making light fittings at the time, it was working for the war effort, making hose clips, and millions and millions of these were stamped out on big presses in the premises. Two of the people who worked there at the time were Rose Rice and Doreen Austin. There were big presses to use for girls, really, and you had to cut out the metal for all these different things that we made. At the time, we were making hose clips to go on bombers, weren't they? Right. weren't they? Yeah. It was hard work, some of it, wasn't it? Yes. There were some huge machines yeah. that went to the yes. roof of the... Yes. That dreadful noise, yes. banging. The Butels were a very good family. They were very good to my family. I had a hemorrhage. The x-ray showed a hole in the lung. I went to a sanatorium in Abingdon and Mr Victor used to bring my mum and dad every weekend to see me and if he couldn't do it, one of the foremen had to do it. As I said, they were a very caring family. There were some stairs at the back of the room that went up to Mr Victor's office. He was revered by everybody. We would all see him coming down the steps in the mornings and everybody go, Mr Victor's coming, Mr Victor's coming. And we'd all heads down. But in actual fact, very nice people to work for. Very often I would be sent up to Mr Alfred with papers to be signed. We used to do so many different strip lights. Big Giotto lights, yeah. shaver lights that go in mm -hmm. the bathroom. What we used to call skellies, little skeleton strip. Thousands of them we used to do. Yeah, and there was some six foot, great wasn't big it? long windshield and, and, and yeah. lights that go above pictures. All different lights. Mm. It was, and it was, it was a pleasure to work. It wasn't scrubble, scrubble, scrubble. Although we all no, had targets no, no. to meet. Nobody was out for themselves. No. If the older ones were struggling with their targets and the younger ones had done theirs, they would go and help the older yeah. ones out. And we always did yeah. that. Canteen was lovely. They used to really try their damnedest to feed us well. And we all enjoyed going to the canteen. We looked forward to it because it was a break from the shop floor. Burnerville. In those days, it was a lot narrower. We used to have to come to the top of Burnerville and um, with Jacks and Jack the lorries over when they used to get stuck between the wall and the house, which is now demolished. The bigger lorries used to quite regularly take the guttering off one of the houses in Burnerville. So our maintenance department used to keep a, a stock of spare guttering pipes and tiles so they could go along and repair the, uh, the, the houses as and when necessary. The work that we were doing was good enough to earn a naval contract in manufacturing below deck lighting for ships Royal Navy. And it would have to go for shock and vibration tests. You had a large metal table. You would then strap the fitting to the table and this ram, a ram would then come up from underneath and wallop the metal table. The shock to my system was when I took some of our fittings and tried them on there, I came back with a carrier bag full of bits. But we got over that. One of the more interesting products used the edge lit principle. So you'd see these years ago in hotels and places like that, it would be an exit sign that looked like a piece of glass 
hanging from a box. But it was acrylic, and the edge of the glass was illuminated by probably a small fluorescent tube inside the box. And then anything etched on the surface, like the word exit, would glow, so you could see it. We've made light fittings for the royal family. We made them for Prince Charles, for when he got married to Princess Diana. And we had the order come in that he wanted them like his mum's. So we got them out and we polished them all up and made the light fittings for him. So everything was tickety-boo for the, for the royal prince. At the start of the morning, lunchtime and the end of the day, there was a whistle, a hooter. Compressed air would be pushed into it and it woo, you'd have a sound bellowed out. Most of the people around mums we could hear it down there. At going home time, when the whistle blew, all the ladies came out of the factory at a rate of knots, and in those days dad had wet fish. A lot of the ladies would buy fish and take home for their husband's tea. So very often, mother was the only one in the shop to do the serving, hence the queues building up because mum couldn't serve them fast enough. Do you remember the opening day when Line and Light moved? Yeah, I do, yeah. This was back in 1985, where uh, Michael Fry, the chairman of the Rotoflex group, opened a bottle of champagne. So we were all outside and he was fizzing up in the air sort of thing. It was quite a wet day, if I remember rightly. But um, all the work sort of turned out. And as I said, there is a £2 million factory opened up. The Lumiance products was mainly the, the Giotto range, which would house all the new compact fluorescent lamps available at the time. Very compact fittings, which created our own issues with temperatures. There was uh, a whole series of products from that, Circo ones, Circular ones, Quattro Square ones. 1987, the company appointed me to run an outward scheme where I was delivering orders to ladies in different areas and it was um, a really big thing for the company because we had 61 operators from around these areas. They used to send the shaver lights, they used to deliver it and we had such a certain time to do them, make them at home and about 300 a week we used to do. You had your screwdriver, evening yeah. times, used to drive my husband mad, but... There you are. <laughs> but it was extra money. <laughs> Overseas they used to do it, didn't they? And they thought they'd bring it into the factory yeah. to get everybody yeah. more relaxed and ready for work. <laughs> or doing exercises oh, yes, first I thing remember, in the morning. Yeah. And of course, as uh, everybody knows, Things went, I wouldn't say they went wrong at line of light, but they went wrong within the, within the group. And um, unfortunately, of all the um, factories, it was the one at Malmesbury that uh, had to go. It was really a pity that, uh, that actually closed down because the efficiency there was very, very good. I don't think any of us really thought that it would end. It was hard to grasp. It was a very sad time because we were one big happy family. Like all companies, it's the people that made Line Light. The buildings are just the buildings and the products are the products. It's the people that are important. Yeah, the people made it. Well, there's a glimpse into the life of the Linolight factory in Malmesbury. The full story is in the book, which is available from the museum shop. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it interesting.